Hey guys, so I just wanted to do this video on coronavirus and I spent the last few weeks really diving deep um, as much as I could read everything that I found to be really important and pertinent um, to review. So I probably spent over like 50 hours looking at the data, listening to different kinds of people talk, um, kind of fact checking a lot of what they're saying. And um, yeah, so I thought I would just uh, do a video to kind of just establish um, really my thoughts on COVID. Um, hopefully this is informational or educational or at least interesting to, to some people. Um, if it's not something you want to um, listen to, you don't have to. Um, but I just thought it would be um, helpful if I could just relay what I've learned and um, sort of a little bit of uh, my thoughts at the end, um, personal opinions about uh, some of this stuff. So, all right, so let's get to it. Um, by the way, I think I've recorded this like 50 times, and so I apologize for bringing it out late, but it's really hard to do, um, so forgive me for taking some time to um, put it together, but hopefully this is my last recording <laughs> or my last attempt. All right, so, um, oh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Amy Couturier. I'm a pediatrician in Traverse City, Michigan. I practice in a solo private practice. I don't work with any other providers, so really um, all my thoughts and opinions here represent just me, my own. Um, I have Munson privileges, but none of this represents Munson either. Um, I am no means an expert on COVID. I, um, I am just somebody who is following closely and doing my best, um, but I wouldn't consider myself a COVID expert, okay? So hopefully this is just helpful for some parents out there who want um, just a real talk on you know COVID directly from a pediatrician. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of go over some numbers and data, try not to inundate you too much, but just uh, my perspective on that and then to go into some really good studies. And so. Um, so far, uh, there's been over 800,000 deaths um, from COVID um, in the U.S. And so that is pretty significant, I think. Um, and 50% of those deaths are in those who are 75 and over. So we know that, right? We know our elderly population are the most at risk, are the most vulnerable. Um, I would say another 25% um, of that total is um, from those who are 45 and over. So very much so it's affecting our adults more than our kids. Um, pediatrics makes up for 0.09% of all total deaths. So there's about around 800 or just over out of um, just over 800,000 deaths. So it comes out to 0.09%. Um, so that sounds great, right? Really low. Kids are awesome. They don't die as much as adults. But you know, the reality of that statement is that that's true for everything. Luckily, our kids are just healthy people. And so they, in general, don't die um, as often as adults. And so that, so I think putting it to perspective, you know, relative to other pediatric deaths is, is more important to think about. Um, now, when we take those 800 deaths in kids, um, it looks like a U-shaped graph. And so um, what I found really interesting, something I didn't really, I wasn't aware of actually, was that um, there are a lot of infant deaths related to COVID. And so um, I'm just gonna pull up the numbers. This is from January, 2020 of October of 2021. So about a year and a half of the pandemic. And under one, there's about 135 deaths. So the graph again, is, kind of goes like this, a so U-shape. Um, so quite a bit of deaths uh, under one. And I wonder if this is like perinatal. I need to look into that more because um, right after one, like the one-year-old age group goes down to like 20. So from 135, it goes to 20. So I wonder if this is more neonatal, kind of right around birth. Maybe parents are presenting with COVID at the time of delivery. I'm not sure. So um, that I find really um, scary and striking. They're actually the highest bar, you know, on that graph. So it kind of goes like this. Um, so it's like a U shape with the lower end being over here. So then one year olds through 12, they're pretty low. So this is our lowest risk age group, okay? From one to 12, they have the lowest amount of death. There is still death, but it's the lowest, um, you know, per, per, prevalence or percentage wise out of all the other age groups. Now, when you hit 13, 14, 15, 16, it starts to trickle back up to like 80s or so. So this lower group, 20 to 30 deaths per age. So like one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and then it goes up to like 80 or, you know, 100, kind of when you get closer to 18, so 16, 17-year-olds. Um, 
So yeah, so I thought that was interesting with the infant death. Um, now, when we look at top 10 leading cause of death, so this is where I think it's more important because in general, like I said, kids are really healthy. They just don't die as much as adults. And so it's important to look relative to other deaths. And so number one cause of death under age 18 has always been, and really by far has been accidental injury. So car accidents, um, you know, uh, drownings, any unintentional accidental injury. Unfortunately, um, that is still really high across all age groups, infant, child, and like young adult teens. Then after that, number two, three, four, five, that the, the upper half of the, um, the charts show in the teens, it's majority things like um, suicide, homicide, um, you know, some meningitis and that kind of thing. But in the top View, it's really these preventable injuries. It's like the accidents and then it's the suicidality. For the middle um, child group and the younger cohort, then it starts to get a little bit of the congenital malformations, the genetic diseases that some kids are born with that um, impact their heart function and things like that. Um, cardiac disease, you know, if you've been born with different kinds of anatomy, um, those are definitely, you know, the top, you know, three, four, five causes of death in, in young kids. Now in the middle kind of section, number five, six, seven, eight, kind of in that range, um, that's where you have your infectious diseases. That's where you have your influenza pneumonia deaths. That's where you have your sepsis pneumonia in infants, your meningitis, meningococcal deaths. That's where you have your, um, you know, and then a little bit of random stuff like uh, strokes and um, just kind of freak strange things that can also happen. So that's generally what the top 10 leading causes of death look like. By far, accidental injuries, okay. After that, some different things. Um, and then in the middle is really your infectious disease. So COVID, COVID stands around number six cause of leading death, which is, I think, pretty high, you know. It's higher than influenza deaths. Um, if you look compared to 2019, when we before we had masking and things like that, um, it, it, we have more deaths due to COVID than we do you know, in prior years due to influenza. Um, so I, I think that's significant. I think that's worth, um, you know, reevaluating in, in our minds. Now, like I said, that age group, that five to 11, they have the least amount of death, right, out of any other age group. Um, their numbers are really the best, but they have something, instead of mortality, they face morbidity. And so morbidity is sort of disease burden. Um, MISC is something that happens often in this age group. So MISC is a multi-system inflammatory disorder. It is this strange thing. Viruses do weird things. Um, we see this all the time. Um, you can get um, you know, viral induced um, Guillain Barre, you can get uh, viral induced um, myositis, um, myocarditis, um, you can get one, you know, um, affecting different parts of your brain, your um, spinal cord, ataxia, different things. And so viruses can induce a lot of weird disease. One in particular that's pretty common is called MISC. So this is multi system inflammatory disease. All your body, a lot of your body systems are just not working. So what would happen is at week two to week six after COVID a natural infection, your your child may have some fevers or something that just doesn't add up, lethargy. They look really sick, like hospital level sick, like sepsis. And so they end up going in. Most of them are in the ICU because their, their functions are not working. They can't pee on their own. They can't breathe on their own. And they may need pressors or something like that. And so, um, so this is really significant because you can imagine like you know, most recover, but a few do die. And when you do recover, you're probably gonna have to follow all these subspecialists, right, for a little while. And I don't know if your child will look the same or not, or have the same um, kind of health status after. So to me, this is um, this is concerning. This is not something I would ever want anyone to have. Um, and there's been a lot of cases. So up until um, September, there were 5,200. Um, and I was trying to take stuff from CDC to be consistent on the numbers, but my guess would be like 55 to 5,800 by now. So total cases of MISC are 5,500, 5,800 maybe. And a little under half are in five to 11 year olds. So I don't know, that, that makes me a little nervous. Um, that I feel like is scary. Majority of it is age nine, a um, little more in boys and girls, but not like a slam dunk, not like the myocarditis side effects from um, COVID vaccine being much more prevalent in men. It's, it's not as much like that, but a little more um, nine-year-old boy is kind of the, um, the peak of that bell curve. 
So I think that's important to just put into perspective and think about that, yes, they have the least amount of mortality, but there is some morbidity there. Um, now, looking at prevalence, there's a lot of drama as to like, what is the true prevalence and, you know, all that. And I think uh, we're constantly trying to find really good quality studies. So there's this one good study in uh, Germany that um, used seroprevalence data. So that, that's a little bit different. So instead of just counting all the total number of COVID cases, which we all know there is not, it's going to be an underreporting of that because there's always home cases or colds that don't get, um, that don't get tested, you know. So um, there are a lot of cases out there that just... Um, are, are there, but we just don't have it in numbers. And so it makes our um, fractions, you know, a little bit skewed. But the Germany study was really great in the sense that they used seroprevalence data of their um, of their whole nation. And so they looked at 35,000 kids and in the denominator was the estimated prevalence of actual cases confirmed, but also looking, comparing and adding a little bit of extra cases due to seroprevalence. So they look at a bunch of people's blood samples and they can extract extrapolate how much how many how much antibodies they're seeing in those blood samples so it's a little bit more of a true detector of the community's um, level of COVID uh, versus just like counting up all the cases and so they took that into account and they're able to get a better denominator um, and then you know in Germany they have um, a different health system so all of their data is just centrally um, easily you know um, centralized, I suppose. And so this covers all the hospitals, all the ICUs, every single kid in Germany. What they found for healthy kids, um, the risk of hospitalization, this is all kids under 18, the risk of hospitalization is 51 per 100,000. So that's not insignificant, I think. That's actually like pretty decently high. But um, again, all relative. Uh, the risk for ICU admissions was eight per 100,000. So that sounded good to me. I was like, great. Um, now, when we look a little closer for age five to 11, the risk of ICU admissions was two per 100,000. So much lower than um, the general healthy population. And actually no deaths were reported between five to 11, which I thought was really interesting. Um, all majority of the deaths that they reported in the study were under five. So again, makes me more nervous about the babies and, and young kids now. Um, and those who died, um, 38% had comorbidities, like 38% were to the point that they were on palliative care or something. So significant predisposition, predisposing health conditions. Um, so I thought that was a really good study when you want to think about, well, what is my kid's risk? I would look to this um, to really look at, you know, real, um, the closest we can get to like that risk of hospitalization. So yeah, 51 per 100,000 is the risk for hospitalization for healthy kids. Um, for five to 11 year olds, the risk of ICU is two per 100,000. Now, you know, what is the risk and benefit, all right? Um, just like, let's just step back for a moment. We're in a pandemic, a hundred year pandemic. This doesn't happen very often, thankfully. Um, but this is, you know, unprecedented times. And so we're in year two of um, this pandemic. We're on our third major uh, variant coming around. Um, in some places, it's already the majority um, of cases. And it is very contagious, right? We have uh, Om Omicron. So far, what I've read about Omicron is that its mortality is um, still very low for, for pediatrics, um, kind of at the same rate as what we're seeing it now with Delta and where we're at um, pre-Omicron. Uh, However, the number of cases are just high and some people are just saying, well, we're just picking it up more because for every hospitalized kids, they get tested. I think that's also true, but I also think a lot more kids are, are just presenting to the hospital with COVID. Um, so I think the COVID, the hospitalization risk is in my mind, my guess is that it's going to be higher than what we've been seeing. Okay, that per 100,000 hospitalization risk is going to be higher. Um, I've also heard that kids are having um, more variable uh, presentations, that it's not all just like mild, that some kids are with Omicron maybe having more influenza-like symptoms, like fever for four or five days or more, um, you know, cough, a sore throat, and that kind of thing. So, um and then, you know, again, um, big hospital systems like the one I trained at, Rainbow Babies and um, CHOP and things like that, they're seeing majority unvaccinated kids and parents. And so I think that's just something to consider again. So, so what am I trying to say? I guess we're in year two, we're headed towards um, 
Omicron, um, we are going to see it here probably in the next month or two. And when it does hit, it's going to be, um, I would say that people who haven't had COVID, uh, I'd be shocked if you don't get it this time. If you're in society living like a normal life, relatively speaking, um, you know, I think the the chances of you getting COVID is really high if you haven't already. And those of you who've had it a while ago, I would suspect that, um, you know, with Omicron, it could be um, something that we could expect. I'm expecting to get it, I think. I'm expecting that, you know, we as a family will probably have it. It is just so contagious. It is, um, if you have 10 people in a room and one person comes in that room, even for a few minutes, nine out of 10 people are going to get it. It is highly, highly contagious. It is a measles level contagion. So, um, so I'm not trying to like create fear or anything. I'm just saying that, um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna come around again, and we're gonna see a spike. And some people think that this could be the end of the pandemic. Um, I'm not so sure. I think I hope so. I hope so. But what it what it takes to end the pandemic is immunity. We need immunity. Have herd immunity, a strong level of herd immunity. At when we are seeing these um, new variants as we're spiking, we need to have a a, um, a certain percentage of immunity to not um, feel so overcome by this um, variant, by, the, by these waves um, in terms of our uh, hospitalization numbers, um, straining you know, on healthcare providers and staff at the hospital and being able to care for people. Not just that, but just like affecting small businesses, affecting um, you know, just day-to-day -day life. And so if we wanna see that stuff kind of go away, we really need to increase um, immunity in our community. Um, and so this kind of goes into, you know, uh, vaccinations. So um, with vaccinations, I think there's a lot of fear with myocarditis. Um, so I'm going to go through that a little bit. Okay. So myocarditis, um, a lot of people are just debating how much myocarditis it really is and for who. And, and so there's been actually some really good recent um, studies that have shown a little bit more um, like getting to that true number, kind of like that German study, really trying to get a little bit honing in on that true number. And so if you look at myocarditis, um, there is a Kaiser study that looked at 12 year olds to 40 year olds. And um, it was fantastic. So Kaiser is a, um, an HMO. They, um, they are the, their own insurance company and, um, you know, they provide healthcare, um, inpatient, outpatient, everything. And so it's a, essentially it's a closed loop. And so what's great about Kaiser is they have, um, really robust data, you know, and they take care of a huge chunk of, um, those areas that they're in. And so especially California, um, but there's this infectious disease doctor who wrote a paper, um, recently December 27th or so, um, she's from Portland and works at Kaiser and she, um, what they did is that they just did a lot more digging. Okay. So for every kid who presented with myo and pericarditis, they just not only looked at the ICD-9 codes for myocarditis, pericarditis, unspecified, whatever, like all the different variations of that ICD-9 code billing, um, for ER visits, hospitalizations. They also went even deeper. They did chart searches that was reviewed independently, like blinded by two different physicians who actually went through um, each chart. Um, you can search the chart uh, with Epic. And so you can see um, if you just search myocarditis, pericarditis. And so they physically like went through these charts to see if those were probable or, or confirmed cases of myocarditis after vaccination. Um, and um, so they pulled some of those. They actually also pulled the cases where patients have may have gone to like an outside hospital. So like a non um, Kaiser institution, um, maybe that those got missed. They, they did not, they included those two. So to me, it was like very, very thorough. I'm not sure how much more, you know, you could look to, to figure out the true number of cases. And so what they found um, for men, okay, men only between the ages of 12 to 17, after the second dose, the risk of myocarditis is about one in 2,700. Um, and then between men 18 and 24, the risk of myocarditis is one in 1,900. So, um, you know, so this is kind of comes into the question with the boosters coming out right now for, for these young kids. And it's, you know, do we need boosters for them? And um, for, so this is where this is now my opinion. Okay. My opinion um, for young and healthy kids, I think I agree with Paul Offit when he describes, well, what is the point of the vaccine? The point of the vaccine is to prevent serious 
and um, serious outcomes with COVID, like death, hospitalization, ICU stays, right? That is the point. The point is not to prevent like a runny nose. So that is should technically not be considered a breakthrough case the way we talk about it. But anyways, um, so if the point of the vaccines is to prevent death and suffering, then um, then the 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 then vaccination makes sense for pretty much any adult primary series. When we talk about boosters, then I think it probably makes more sense for the elderly, those with comorbidities, but not necessarily for younger people due to that risk of myocarditis. And um, and the fact that the primary series has, has given them about 90 plus percent um, effectiveness against serious disease, right? So if that holds true, which we think it is, that mRNA vaccines are pretty specific and they're pretty awesome compared to all the other vaccines that we have, like flu shots, there's an inactivated vaccine. I wish the flu shot could be as effective as the um, mRNA vaccines. But, um, you know, so the, so that's kind of where um, I feel like, you know, may not make sense for um, uh, boosters for young kids. Um, but um, I do I do think that we need immunity to end the pandemic. Um, I, I strongly feel that uh, for those people who have not had their COVID vaccine and you're an adult, I really feel like you should get the primary series mRNA, you know, not the J&J &J anymore, um, but the mRNA vaccines. I do think that um, just putting that into perspective, we are in year two of a global pandemic. Um, this is sort of the time, you know, when this fizzles out and becomes like an influenza-like cold, like, so, you know, there's some disease morbidity, it's still a top 10, you know, um, cause of death in kids and that kind of thing. But um, it's fizzled out a little bit. I can, I can see that. I can see being a little more choosy as to like your risk factors and stuff like that. We'll just have to see. But I think right now we're like in the midst of a novel virus with, with new variants that are extremely contagious. I just feel like... I just don't understand, um, you know, I don't know. We all know cases, right, of young, healthy people dying of COVID. And I think, um, to me, it's just, it's really concerning. Um, so so that's just me, okay? It, again, we don't all have to agree. I'm just, this video is just my own opinion. Um, so that's how I feel. I feel like everyone should get their primary series if you're an adult. I think for kids, I think that it makes sense, although they are young and healthy and they don't die as much. I do think that there is some morbidity with the young kids and this infant group is really high in terms of the number of deaths. Um, I do think that there is some, some um, we should be cautious. I think we're in a pandemic, we're seeing high, high uh, contagion with Omicron. I do think that we should um, vaccinate our kids, even though the risk is low. Now, should we get boosters for, for boys? No, I don't think so. I, not right now. I don't think that that makes sense right now. Um, should we, um, should we, what, what do you do with um, boy, you know, boys who fall in a little bit to this myocarditis risk in general, even after dose two, what do we do with them? Yeah, no, for sure. So for out of all the people, the young males, you know, the 12 to 24 year olds are the highest risk for this myocarditis from the vaccine. So that's really the biggest drawback in terms of risk benefit looking at um, should, should those people get the shots. Um, I think there are some things we can think about. So what if we space dose one and two? Um, I think there's some interesting data about this um, in other countries, Canada, UK, they actually uh, state that it's, you're going to have more robust immunity if you space dose one and two. Um, someone I really respect and follow, Monica Gandhi, she's an immunologist. Um, she's a physician immunologist at UCSF. She does HIV work and she's uh, phenomenal. She has an 11 year old boy and she spaced his dose by eight weeks. Um, and um, I think that is that is maybe a great way to mitigate some of the myocarditis risk for the benefit of 90 something percent of immunity as we hit every single variant, every wave. Um, so, and, and you know, there is a myocarditis risk from COVID infection, right? Um, some, some will argue that it's definitely higher from COVID infection. I find that um, that's probably true. I just have to kind of break it down by age group. Um, and when I did look for this age group to compare directly against men 
12 to 24 year olds myocarditis risk from vaccine versus infection, I still find that it's um, higher from infection. Um, so anyways, um, so that's what I've learned and that's what kind of my conclusions are. Um, you know, things to think about for people, like how do you make this decision? Yes, there is, and then there's this level of uncertainty before I end really with Omicron. So um, a lot of kids are getting it. There's a lot of hospitalizations with pediatrics specifically, um, mortality is staying about um, status quo. So, but we don't know what could happen, right? We don't know if there, maybe there's more MISC. I think there's a sense of like this unknown. Um, and we see this with influenza, like for me that does, uh, give me a little bit of anxiety because with influenza, we would typically see years where it was really easy year, you know, flu A, majority, 92% of all cases, no big deal. Um, and then years when we had flu B is much more of that myocarditis, actually. We saw a lot of myocarditis, a lot of myositis with flu B. Um, and then, you know, in terms of like, you know, Tamiflu, Tamiflu is just like, it's terrible. It tastes terrible for kids. And so, um, so I feel like vaccinations are best tool against influenza, even though it's such a, you know, crappier, like, uh, um, effectiveness compared to the mRNA vaccine. It's still, to me, it's a cost benefit, um, makes sense just because there's not a lot of treatment and there's not a lot of things that we can do. Um, so, but I feel like with COVID, um, you know, the drugs out with COVID, a lot of them are not um, for kids. And then, so really we're just um, putting in the hospital with IV fluids and supporting your um, your organ functions. And so anyways, I just feel like after actually going through all this, I feel that um, although kids are at low risk of dying, um, it's super prevalent, right? It's just, it's like the number one cause of cold right now. And with Omicron, it's absolutely going to be. And, um, and there's a lot of morbidity associated with this. Um, we're in a year two of a global pandemic, a hundred year pandemic. This is the time to vaccinate, I think. This is a time to get our immunity up, get through these waves, make these waves you know, peak lower because they're gonna keep doing this, we know that. But in order for it to fizzle out, we have to have more and more people infected. Um, or sorry, immune. And so if you're not vaccinated, you're basically gonna get infected and then have natural immunity, which I wanna say natural immunity, you know, there are good studies that show that you have um, um, a fair response to, uh, to your antibody production with natural immunity. However, one thing I'll say is that there's nothing that's a slam dunk because every body is different. So um, maybe if you had a really easy case of COVID, maybe you didn't spike as much, um, maybe you didn't make as much antibodies, you know, I think that's possible. I think um, kids definitely hold their antibodies longer than adults. So I think for the adults, another reason to vaccinate regardless of prior infection. Um, and then with kids, you know, yeah, they may hold their antibodies longer, but I think there's still variability in that. Which antibodies are they gonna to make to spike protein capsid? So there's some studies that kind of show that. Um, but you know, there's always like, it's always like a bell curve. So some kids don't make it, some kids do. Nothing is like 100%. And so, I don't know, I kind of feel that if we um, want to be immune to a novel virus, then we should just get vaccinated because it is a set amount of um, vaccine in that vial, it's 0.2 mLs. I draw it up myself, 0.2 mLs, it's set dose. Um, that dose was studied to show 90% effectiveness. I think, you know, I, I did talk a little bit um, to some of you about what if you had natural infection and you just get one dose. You know, Paul Offit, his response to that, um, Paul Offit, by the way, is a um, immunologist, a pediatric infectious disease expert. He, um, sorry, not immunologist, an infectious disease expert at CHOP. Uh, he sits on the ACIP and FDA um, organizations. He's phenomenal. And so I would YouTube him if you guys are looking for um, a more evidence-based uh, talk about COVID. So anyway, so Paul Offit would say to that answer is, um, you know, one dose wasn't studied. It didn't show enough neutralizing antibodies. And so why why make that gamble? Um, if, you, if you want the um, protection, you should, you should get the two dose vaccine um, because the second dose showed a much, much higher uh, amount of neutralizing antibodies than the first. So, so it kind of makes sense to me. I mean, um, we can play the game of like, well, my science or my ideas are this, 
we can also just not play the game and go with, you know, what we are thinking in terms of um, the science and what has been known and what's unknown. And there's a lot of that. And so how do you balance it all? So for me, um, yeah, I, I, I feel that everyone should have primary series. Um, we are in a pandemic. Um, we're not in year five of, a, of COVID, we're in year two. And so we're still hitting some really highs and some really high death rates. And so I think it's important. Number two, boosters. I, I don't know about young people getting it. I'm not sure if I agree with that right now. Um, mainly because they should have great protection after their primary series and the risk of myocarditis, how much is it adding, right? Versus that risk of myocarditis in the young males specifically. So I would say boosters for elderly and those um, 45 and over, maybe with or without comorbidities or just with comorbidities, I'm not sure there. Um, kids, vaccine. I think it's important to have immunity as we walk through a Omicron, which is as contagious as it can get. Um, because what would happen, right? I always ask myself this question, if your child got sick and is hospitalized with COVID pneumonia or whatever, um, MISC, in that moment, what would you wish? Would you wish that you had gotten the vaccine if you hadn't? I think I would, absolutely. I think I would feel absolutely horrendous. I would never be able to forgive myself. Um, so that's why we're getting it. Um, so my daughter, yeah, she had uh, natural immunity or natural infection a um, couple months back. And I was like, well, maybe, you know, we could wait. You know, I did a deeper dive into the literature and I basically found that, yeah, she probably has some antibodies. Absolutely. I don't know how much. I don't know what kind. And I don't know how long that will last. And for me, um, it is the number six killer and kids, uh, COVID, and we're about to see a super contagion and I'm expecting to get it. Um, I'm just expecting to get Omicron, <laughs> even though we just had it. I think like, I think they, it is so contagious that, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll get it and maybe she'll be okay. Cause she had some natural immunity. Um, maybe there's some enough neutralizing antibodies against Omicron, but we don't know. I think there's a little bit of a nebulous, you know, question mark there. Um, I just, I don't want that guilt over my head. And so she's, um, she's vaccinated against um, COVID or is in the process of getting her second dose now. So that's what we're doing. Um, and then I, yeah, I worry a little bit about that young baby, you know, uh, my other daughter, Aria, she's 18, 19, 20 months now, something like that. And so she's kind of in that other uh, risk factor now and the, the age one where it kind of dropped a lot, but still, um, just makes me nervous, you know, the young kids are, are getting um, a lot of disease burden too. So, so yeah, hopefully this is helpful. I'm sorry if, um, if you are, you know, angry by this, I think, I think that's just the nature of COVID. I, I did my best. I read everything I possibly could. I follow um, a bunch of people in case you guys are interested. I follow Vinay Prasad. Um, I subscribe to his Substack too. I pay for his uh, paid content. I listen to Z-Dog just to kind of um, hear different sides of a coin. I think that helps me just have perspective and to uh, feel balanced. Um, same with Vinay Prasad. I think he's he's a big challenger of, of, of the data. So I think that's, I appreciate that. I follow, follow Monica Gandhi. She's fantastic. She's also at UCSF and she's an um, immunologist who is the one um, who talks about spacing, you know, between dose one and two. And, and um, so I would recommend that. The only caveat I have with that is if we're in, in the midst of a surge with Omicron, the only risk is that you could, um, you could get the infection in between those two doses. So just something to consider. Spacing is maybe ideal, but maybe, um, but maybe you have to run the risk, you know, will you get COVID in between because you're waiting so long? I don't know. Um, so there's that possibility. And we know that the second dose really does help with the neutralizing antibodies. So now that we're about to see it, you know, I would just say maybe somewhere in between <laughs> three weeks, eight weeks, somewhere in there, if I, whatever, five, six weeks, something like that sounds good. Um, and really the myocarditis risk is the highest in 12 and over, 12, 16 and over. So if your kid's younger than that, I think 21 days is fine. Anyways, um, 
yeah, and for those of you who have done well without vaccination, then that's great. You know, I, I wish, I don't wish any negativity upon upon your health or anything. Um, I just would say for all of us um, on whatever side spectrum issue, I think it's, and regardless of COVID, whatever we're talking about, um, I think it's important to be flexible in our thoughts and opinions. It's okay to change your mind. Um, for me, I am always doing that in medicine, right? We're always adapting to, to what's in front of us, to the picture, the clinical situation in front of us and trying to use our best judgment. There's always a sense of gray area. And I think being flexible in um, what we used to think and then being flexible and changing that is, is how we grow as people, is how we, how we become good doctors, right? Um, I don't want to be the kind of doctor when I'm like in my 50s that's still practicing the way I did when I just came out because clearly medicine should have changed by then, at least somewhat. So I think it's important to, um, to kind of keep following what um, the evidence is showing um, and to um, just do our best, right? And then after that, I think um, whatever. I think, we, yes, we need to send our kids to school. We need to kind of live our normal lives. Um, you know, and then regarding masking, I think that's a whole different topic. It's really a policy topic. Um, and that, that one's really tough, especially right now as TCAPS is going mask optional. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, the WHO does not recommend masking under six. Um, and I think that would be, I think that would be also make sense to me if you look at cloth masking, um, its effectiveness against an aerosolized virus, especially as contagious as Omicron. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good argument against that. I feel like they're going to get it, even if they're wearing a cloth mask, just as much as if they weren't personally. I think if they're wearing a surgical mask, there's been evidence to show that it's a reduction of like 11.8% reduction in risk compared to like not wearing anything. And then the, um, you know, the comfort level of wearing a KN95, it just depends. And, um, and yeah, and yeah, so there, I mean, there's always going to be leakage, right? So for me, the masking issue is much more dicey and difficult um, if we were a more immunized community, if we had higher rates of, um, of, uh, immunity via vaccine and natural immunity, which I don't know really our percentage, but just guesstimating, we're not as high as, um, the goal really is. And so we will see, I think, a peak with Omicron. Um, but because of that, um, it makes it difficult to, to say, you know, not to mask. Personally, I would love to see the six and younger not being in mass. Um, the only thing that gives me pause is that little babies, all the little babies, the under one who've uh, had really a lot of death due to COVID relative to other kids. Um, so I don't know about how I feel about that part, but I think if we, I think there's a good argument for that too. Um, and I would be okay with that. I think over six, um, maybe we could look at, you know, how much is going around the community. But again, I think if we're gonna make a mask, they should wear at least surgical masks. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. Um, anyways, I think it's much more difficult to talk about policy. Um, it's much easier to talk about data. <laughs> so hopefully you found this informative. Really um, wish that um, at least you know, it's helpful to listen to viewpoints that you may or may not agree with. I think it's, um, I think it's always good to, to be open and listen. So, so yeah, and I'm always available to have the discussion about COVID. I, I love it because I always learn more. And for anyone who wants to send me stuff, you can absolutely email me at info at upnorthpediatrics.com. Happy to review um, data or studies and to tell you kind of what I think, or this is a very low powered study. I wouldn't put a lot of weight into this or whatever. I'm happy to analyze it. Happy to just um, start a discussion. That's okay. But um but yeah, so those, that's kind of all my thoughts right now. And so um, hopefully this is helpful. And for anyone who has questions, just reach out to me personally. All right, well, take care. Happy New Year, everybody. Hopefully everyone stays ha ha healthy and safe and we can all have our kids stay in school. And yeah, um, I guess we'll talk soon.